Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about sequence convergence. And what that means is we're going to analyze the long-term behavior of a sequence. So the section is called sequence convergence. And as I said, the idea here is to talk about the long term behavior of a sequence. Let's start with the definition. In particular, we'll distinguish basically three cases. The first one will be if a sequence gets closer and closer to a certain value, then we will call that sequence convergent to that value. And that value will then be called the limit. That's the first definition we'll be talking about. As an alternative, a sequence could also tend to infinity, meaning it takes on higher and higher positive values, or it could tend to minus infinity, meaning it takes on lower and lower values, so negative values. Or it could show none of these behaviors. Maybe um, it would jump around certain values, um, or it might be completely unpredictable. So these sequences will be called divergent. Now, more precisely, let's say we have a sequence. A n with index set n zero. This is called convergent. If there is a number that's usually called a or alpha, we call it alpha here to avoid confusion with the sequence itself. That is then a real number such that the following holds. This is going to be a little complicated, a little technical, unfortunately. So let me first give you the, the, the idea here. Let's say we have a sequence. Say this is the real number. So here's one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And let's say we have a sequence that behaves like this. Let's say it starts here, that's just a zero, then maybe it jumps there, then back up, back down, and maybe then it stays down, but gets closer and closer to zero. And the idea is here, in the long term, that sequence tends to zero. So the values of the sequence get closer and closer to zero without leaving that again. And what we'll do is, we call this a convergent sequence because it closes in on a certain value. And in this case, that's the value zero. And that value is called the limit. So this here, this is going to be our alpha in this case. That's going to be the limit of that sequence. Now, how do we express that formally? The formal idea is the following. Um, for every positive epsilon, and this is going to be the distance from zero. So we prescribe a certain maximum distance from zero. And if the sequence converges, then there is always an index such that all following elements of the sequence are within a distance of at most epsilon from the limit. That's the idea here. So for every prescribed distance epsilon, there is an index, we call that n epsilon, of course that will depend on the choice of epsilon. So an index that is in the set n0, such that now we want to evaluate the distance of the sequence elements, so the a n, from alpha, that is just the absolute value of the difference. So that's the distance between those two. 
So, so this distance is less than epsilon. And that needs to hold for all elements that come after this index n epsilon. And of course, they are index elements as well. So the epsilon, you kind of see that here in our chart, for example, if we prescribe epsilon to be this distance here, and then we take that distance in both directions, positive and negative. So this here is epsilon, that distance. And this here too. So we want the sequence elements to be less than this distance epsilon from the limit alpha. And that's happening here. If you look at uh, these elements, those are lying outside of the prescribed distance, but this one here is inside the distance and all following elements are also inside the distance, right? So this here is the first time the sequence is actually within distance epsilon from alpha. And this is the sequence element, let's see, four. And equals four, so that's the first time this happens. And that means our n epsilon in this case is four. For four, five, six, seven, eight, and all following uh, indices, the sequence elements are within distance epsilon. Um, and this works for every epsilon, so we can make epsilon arbitrarily small, and still there is such an index such that the um, sequence elements will eventually be within distance epsilon. Of course, if we make that smaller, we'll have to increase that index, but there will always be such an index. And if that happens, then this sequence is called convergent. And furthermore, the number alpha is called the limit. I've mentioned that already, so let's write it down as well. The number alpha is then called the limit of the sequence a n. And the notation is we write alpha equals lim of a n or sometimes alpha equals lim of a n for n to infinity if you want to express that specifically. Or also sometimes a n tends to alpha for n to infinity. We can write this in that way as well. Okay, so we say a n converges or tends to alpha. If a sequence is not convergent, we will call it divergent. So divergent is the opposite of convergent. And then there's special cases of divergent sequences that are the sequences that uh, are divergent because their values increase above every possible bound. And we'll say those tend to infinity or also the ones that tend to minus infinity means um, they decrease below every possible bound. So a sequence a n n0 is set to 10, so it tends to infinity 
minus infinity if for all possible bounds let's call those uh, B so all B that are positive there is a number and B in N0 with well either a n is greater or equal to that bound for all n greater or equal to n b and of course and in the index set or for the minus infinity we want that a n is less or equal to minus b again for all large enough indices so in particular you notice that the small indices are not relevant we can always restrict ourselves to the large indices if we're talking about convergence of the sequence what it does for indices somewhere below that is not really relevant you can always cut off the beginning so to say if we're interested in convergence only Um, of course, there's also a notation for that case. And the notation here is simply, we'll write the limit of a n is plus or minus infinity. And please note, a sequence that tends to plus or minus infinity is not convergent. It's still a divergent sequence. It's a special kind of divergent sequence though. So a sequence with limit a n equals plus or minus infinity is divergent. It does not have a finite limit and that is why it's divergent. So as usual, let's have a look at a few examples of how we can apply that definition First one, let's have a look at uh, the sequence that we've already encountered, the sequence one over two to the power of n. And I claim that this sequence converges. We've already seen how it behaves. Um, it starts with one, then one over two, one over four, one over eight, one over 16, and so on. And you can see the elements get smaller and smaller, but they all stay above zero and I claim the limit of the sequence is zero. So a n n zero converges with limit of a n being zero. Now, of course, the interesting question here is how do I prove that using my definition? And that's uh, something that we won't do too often, but it might be good to see that at least once. So let's say we have a number epsilon that is positive, but arbitrary, arbitrarily small in particular. Um, then we want to show that eventually a n minus zero is below this distance epsilon. So we have a look at a n minus zero. And we want that to be less than epsilon. And we'd like to find an index such that this is always the case for indices from that point on. So what do we do? Well, let's uh, substitute the definition. A n is simply one over two to the power of n. Minus zero is, does not do anything. Um, and one over two to the power of n is always positive. So we can also forget about the absolute value here. So what we want is this to be less than epsilon. And that of course happens if and only if, let's take the logarithm of that one. The logarithm of the left-hand side is less or equal to the logarithm of epsilon. Notice that we can take the logarithm because both signs are positive. 
Now we're just using the logarithm laws. First thing you'll notice that we can take the n before the logarithm. So this is the same thing as n times ln of 1 over 2. And then, of course, we can just solve this for n. So this is the case if and only if. Let's divide by ln 1 over 2. And you have to pay attention here. Um, remember that the ln of 1 over 2 is negative. So if you divide by a negative number, then the um, comparison flips, right? So it's not less anymore, it's larger than. So this is larger than ln epsilon over ln 1 over 2. So what we have to do is we just have to set our index n epsilon to exactly this number and epsilon and then 1 over 2 and it needs to be a natural number so of course we, we just round up to make sure it is a natural number so this is rounding up to the next integer and then there's uh, this um, case that we have to still respect here that this might actually be a natural number and then rounding up does not do anything but we need our index to be strictly greater here and not not equal to so to make sure that is always the case we just add one yeah and then all n's that are greater or equal to capital n epsilon are always greater than this expression here okay so then a n minus zero will always be less than epsilon for all n that are greater or equal to n epsilon. And that means the limit is indeed zero and that completes our proof. Let's have a look at a sequence that is not convergent as well. We just take the sequence a n equals minus 1 to the power of n. So what that sequence does basically is it, uh, it jumps around like this. So starting at 0, we start at plus 1. Then the sequence jumps to minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, and so on. And uh, you can guess this is obviously not a conversion sequence, um, but how do we show this using the definition? It's obviously bounded, but it's divergent. And again, we have to prove that. Uh, if you want to prove that, let's assume it was convergent. So assume a n n zero was convergent with limit alpha. Then the first thing we'll note is if the limit is not one, then we can easily construct um, a counterexample here. So if, sorry, if alpha is not one, then what that means is a n minus alpha. Well, what will that be? It will always be greater or equal to alpha, uh, to sorry, to one minus alpha for alpha less or equal to one, right? So if we say the limit might be here, for example, it's not one, um, then this distance here this distance here will always be greater or equal to one minus alpha. And of course that distance as well 
and vice versa if we flip. So if, if uh, alpha is below zero, but greater than minus one, then that's also the case. Okay, so obviously um, this cannot zero in, so the limit cannot become arbitrarily small if alpha is not one. And that means the only possible case is alpha is one. So let's have a look at one. Well, obviously then a n minus one. Let's have a look at the cases where the sequence has a value of minus one. Then this distance here between one and minus one is obviously two. So this distance is two for all odd n. And again, that means there is no index such that this distance becomes arbitrarily small for every subsequent index value. So that means, for example, for epsilon equals one over two, that distance will be greater than one over two for all odd n. And that means there is no n epsilon such that a n minus one is less than epsilon for all values of the index that are greater or equal to n epsilon. All the odd ones will still be above that bound. Okay, so that proves that this sequence is indeed divergent. And finally, let's have a look at the Fibonacci sequence. F n and zero. Okay, you remember the Fibonacci sequence was defined by setting f zero to zero, f one to one, and then f n plus one to f n plus f n minus one for n greater or equal to one. So in particular, that means fn plus one is greater or equal to fn. It's an increasing sequence. We noted that already. Also, fn plus one is greater or equal to two fn minus one, simply because it's equal to the sum of these two and this fn in turn is greater or equal to fn minus one. Let me actually write that down. So fn plus one is equal to fn plus fn minus one. And this here is greater or equal to fn minus one. Well, so what does that mean? Well, that means, of course, we can just repeat that process and then say, well, this is greater or equal to two times two times f n minus three and so on. So if we start with an odd index, so an index like two k plus one, any odd number, then this is greater or equal to two times f two k minus one plus one and so on. And if you just repeat that process often enough, we get back to F1, the lowest odd number that we can have as an index. And that will then be greater to uh, two to the K times F1. F1 is one, so that's equal to two to the power of K. And what that means is that the Fibonacci sequence outgrows every possible bound, obviously. It's uh, going to be at some point larger than two to the K, and of course two to the K outgrows every possible bound. So that means 
the limit of Fn is infinity. So in particular, the Fibonacci sequence is divergent. Finally, I quickly like to remark that if a sequence is convergent, then of course its limit is uniquely defined. There cannot be two different limits. So if a sequence is convergent, its limit is unique. And I'd also like to give you a quick proof for that, because that's a nice example of arguments that you'll often see surrounding sequences. Let's say we have a sequence that a n and zero be a sequence. And let's say we have two different limits with limits alpha and beta in the real numbers. What we have to show is that necessarily alpha is equal to beta, so they cannot be different. The sequence is, is convergent because it has limits. So let's say we take any positive value for epsilon and we take a corresponding index n epsilon in n0 such that the distance a n minus alpha is less than epsilon over two. You can of course um, demand a lower distance here. And also we'd like a n minus beta to have a distance of epsilon over two at most. And that is to hold for all n greater or equal to n epsilon. So for this epsilon over two, we just search the necessary index such that the sequence is within alpha for all subsequent indices. And we also search the index such that it is within beta for all subsequent indices. And we take the larger one of those two. And that's going to be our capital N epsilon. Then the following happens. Let's have a look at the distance of alpha and beta, alpha minus beta. We can express that as alpha minus a n plus a n minus beta. So what we did basically is we added a zero in between. And now we're applying the triangle inequality well, this is less or equal to alpha minus a n absolute value plus a n minus beta absolute value. The order of the two sums in the absolute value does not matter. We can always take out the minus one here. So this is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is equal to epsilon. And as epsilon was arbitrary, that means we can prove that the distance between alpha and beta becomes arbitrarily small. So that means it can only be zero. Otherwise, if it wasn't zero, we could always take half of that distance as our epsilon and prove it's actually smaller than their own distance would be. So that uh, would be a contradiction. So as epsilon was arbitrarily small, we get alpha minus beta is equal to zero in a distance. And that of course means alpha is equal to beta. That proves that the limit is always unique. And what you should remember from this proof is especially the idea to add a factor of zero. We do this more often in the future and then apply the triangle inequality to the absolute value. Also something that will happen pretty frequently in uh, what we'll discuss in the following. So this completes this introduction to a sequence convergence. There's of course more to say about that and more to say about 
some special sequences that you should know and that you should know about their limits. But we'll do this in one of the following videos. And uh, I hope I'll see you then.